So welcome everyone to today's seminar session. And I'm really excited to welcome Professor Martin Adams from the Universidad de Chile. Um, Martin obtained his first degree in engineering from the University of Oxford, and then also continued to do his PhD in robotics research there. And afterwards, he went to the Institute of Robotics at ETH, where he continued as a part-time lecturer and, research and researcher in autonomous robot navigation. And he also was employed as a guest professor for control theory in St. Gallen, and also in Switzerland, before he then moved on to the uh, European Semiconductor Equipment Center, also in Switzerland, um, also doing robotics research. From there, he, he went to NTU at Singapore as a professor and um, is now professor of electrical engineering and the director of the Department of Electrical Engineering at the University of Chile. And his research is focused on autonomous robot navigation, sensing, sensor data, interpretation, and control. And he's also the uh, principal investigator of the industrial sponsored Advanced Mining Technology Center at the University of Chile. So without further ado, um, Martin, please take it away. The floor is yours. Okay, thanks very much, Costa, for a very nice welcome. And I'd like to thank you and also um, Tejaswi, who um, uh, invited me for this talk. I met him actually during my sabbatical last year, or in 2019 to 2020, that was at ETH in Zurich in Roland Siegwart's Autonomous Systems Laboratory. Um, so it's nice to have received emails from him um, initially inviting me for this talk. Uh, it's a great honor to be here at the Sydney Institute for Robotics and Intelligent Systems. That's a name I hadn't heard before until I looked you all up again for this talk. I always remember the ACFR, of course. And anyway, I'd like to spend the next, um, well, 45, maybe 50 minutes or so, talking about work I've been doing over the past couple of decades, as Graham pretty much said, on state estimation with random finite sets. So as you just heard, my name is Martin Adams. I'm here from the Department of Electrical Engineering and from a centre called the AMTC, or Advanced Mining Technology Centre, which is all part of the University of Chile. Um, the pictures you see on the front or on this initial slide here correspond to some of the application areas that I've been involved with. And random finite sets over the past couple of decades um, have been used for a very wide variety of applications, such as um, space situational awareness is the posh name, which literally means trying to track and improve the track catalogs of junk in space. And as you've probably heard, there is a lot of it in space, some of it very small pieces, um, particularly when there's misdetections and false alarms, such as you can see in the right hand scan up here. Also in um, mapping in underground mines, as you can see with one of our robots and actually one of your radars here. This is a radar we bought from the company AccuMine of course, which Graham was very much involved with, or I think even directed. Um, also tracking of people in very cluttered environments. So we can actually clutter and label people for security purposes so that we know whether there's the correct amount of people in a certain area, whether there's people there that shouldn't be there and so on. And even applications as diverse as tracking and identifying cells under a microscope. Um, in order to keep track of maybe cancerous populations and healthy cell populations and so on. So I would like to split the talk into the following four points. Um, firstly, and very briefly, I'm just going to give you a flavor of some of the projects that I've been involved with at the University of Chile, particularly in mapping and tracking, maybe a little bit on SLAM, but I'm going to talk more about SLAM later. And then in part two of the talk, um, I'm going to try to provide some motivation as to why, at least I, I believe, random finite sets provide very useful mathematical tools for all of these problems. In other words, addressing many applications in mapping, tracking, and autonomous navigation or simultaneous localization and mapping uh, as well. In the third part of the talk, I'm gonna specifically focus on the well-known SLAM and multi-target tracking problems 
particularly on SLAM. And I'm going to try to convince you of some of the conundrums that exist in current implementations of SLAM and show you again how we believe that random finite sets can address some of those conundrums or some of those problems that we see in state-of-the-art methods. And finally, I'll finish with some conclusions and ideas for uh, future work. So mapping, tracking, and SLAM, if you like, at the University of Chile, what have we been doing recently? Um, here you can see one of our robots. This is a, a clear path vehicle from um, the company ClearPath in um, Canada. It's called the Husky um, vehicle, skid steer vehicle, and it's carrying a three-dimensional laser range finder, um, one of the radars from AccuMine. This is a two-dimensional version, as well as a, a camera system and various other sensors as well. And we've had projects with uh, Codelco, which is the largest uh, mining company here in Chile, primarily producing copper. We're the world's largest producer of copper. And they often want us to do some pretty simple and sometimes more complicated tasks in their mines. Um, some of the simpler tasks can be finding the volume of a section of mine, which is obviously changing with time when it becomes loaded with material or even changes shape. And other more complicated ones can be really creating three-dimensional geometric underground maps of mines. And one of the challenges in this project was really stitching together static scans. So in this case, taken from 45 locations within um, a section of the El Teniente mine or the Lieutenant mine that translates to here in Chile um, and actually registering it correctly, which does actually require a solution to the SLAM problem. So all of the white points you see here are um, laser returns. And they're kind of rendered to look like a video in the top left here, but remember they're taken from static locations. And these colorful points are actually from the 2D radar that can sometimes be useful in helping us register the laser data, particularly when there are high levels of dust uh, and so on. Okay, um, here you can see the results of stitching together, if you like, static scans that you can see in the top here in order to try to get a consistent um, registered map of the environment. So this is a plan view, the different colors corresponding to scans taken at different locations. And it's just shown as a different, um, from a different perspective uh, here. A very different application, but um, maybe surprisingly mathematically quite similar in nature is that of space debris tracking. And we've had a few projects funded by um, the US Air Force, which has various offices all over the world. One of them is here in Santiago. It's the Southern Office of um, Aerospace Research um, and Development um, Office. And we managed to get data from a radar, which is actually an Australian and UK joint project. So this radar you see on the left is in a very small village called Chilbolton in the south of the UK. It was initially used for weather monitoring, but now since 2010 has been used specifically for um, space debris tracking. And some of the problems that you can see with a, a scan that you can see here over Western Europe is uh, there's a single piece or there's a single defunct satellite actually making its pass over the field of view of this radar. But there are many false alarms, all these points that you can see over here, as well as missed detection. So there are sections of the trajectory that are missing as well. So obviously the challenge in um, trying to improve the trajectory estimates of these defunct satellites is dealing with these false alarms, dealing with the misdetections and really extracting the good stuff um, out of this data. Um, those of you that have watched the film Gravity will of course know the dangers of space junk and possible chain reactions that collisions can cause in space. This junk is moving at very high speeds. So some of the work we've done with that is to both simulate and actually use real data. This one is a simulation um, of particular networks of radio as well as optical telescopes. So what this actually shows in the Earth-centric inertial frame, these gold stars represent the positions of particular telescopes which form part of the Falcon Telescope Network. Um, there are, I believe, two in Australia, one in um, uh, just north of Perth, and another one in a place called Jinjin, I think I went to visit, and another one near Canberra. 
There's a, one near Santiago here and one in Berlin, all over the world. And the idea is trying to track multiple targets um, which are actually defunct broken satellites as they're in orbit around the world. Now, the challenge in this kind of work is one is initial orbit determination. How on earth do you initialize a filter? Uh, it makes sense, of course, to make um, to look at where was the satellite initially when it was working? Um, what is the most recent information we have about it? But also we can use the mathematical constraints of its orbit, such as the eccentricity of the orbit, um, major axis length and so on um, using energy considerations. Um, the real challenge is that you can often observe one of these defunct satellites only for seconds or maximum minutes, and then it's often not visible by any of the telescopes for several hours. So you can imagine that you can get quite significant drift occurring during that time. If I wind the video forward a bit, we're actually using particles here uh, to represent. Here you can see, maybe I'll go back a little bit, um, the trajectory spreading along the orbits because there's been no observation of this particular piece of junk for quite some time. And then once an observation is made, which can be several hours later, this is speeded up, um, that set of particles will contract into a much better estimate, uh, you just contracted there, of where that piece of, piece of debris is. Um, again, another kind of application, if you like, this is using random finite set based labeled multi-target tracking filters to track people and actually vehicles. In this particular example, it's only people using radar and LIDAR. And a true tracking filter should not only be able to estimate the position and possibly even velocity vector of moving objects, but should also be able to label them. That means um, it can actually track the identity, uh, at least in terms of a label, um, as things are moving in space. You can see these red dots are flashing on and off. They correspond to radar detections because sometimes people are missed, sometimes they're detected. We also threw in a bit of um, fog from one of these disco fog machines, as you can see here, to try to pull the LIDAR at least and see how our tracking continues. So here again, you can see multi-target tracking um, in an environment where we can have environmental contamination and we're actually trying to update the position velocity and identity of people as they're moving around. So the idea of that was to give you just a five minute or I think probably 10 minute flavor of what we've been doing um, in mapping and tracking primarily. I didn't show the slam because I'm gonna show you some results later. But what I'd really like to do now is to try and provide some motivation as to why I think this particular area called random finite sets is very attractive trying to solve or offer solutions um, to these problems. Um, here you can see one of our vehicles. This is that Husky vehicle you saw earlier, carrying various sensors. One of them is a, a scanning laser rangefinder. The other one is the, the radar that you can see above, scanning in with a source plate scanning in two dimensions, as well as one of the Microsoft Kinect color cameras um, at the bottom there. And what you can see on this slide is the results of taking data or a scan with each of those sensors in the same location without moving the vehicle, but at different times. So the column on the left corresponds to a radar scan. The red crosses correspond to a plan view of radar detections, um, which have been made with a, a, an algorithm. And the second one corresponds to the results of a laser scan and applying RANSAC to detect a straight line. And the third one corresponds to applying what we call the speeded up robust feature uh, extractor to um, an image um, taken from the camera. And on the right, we did exactly the same experiment again, as I said, without moving the robot, just a few seconds apart effectively. And the idea of the slide is, as it says on the left, to show you the random nature, not only of spatial, uh, measurements, um, but also the random nature of detections. So if we look at this radar data at the top, um, the green ellipses um, are supposed to show the ground truth locations of various objects such as lampposts, trees, um, within a car park environment. This was actually done back in Singapore um, when I used to work there, and we'll see some more results later. 
And if you look carefully, the robot is positioned at the origin with the radar on top of it. And these red crosses often correspond. There are several red crosses corresponding to those um, features, lampposts, etc. cetera. Um, some of them from a wall on the right over here. But if you look carefully, you'll see that three of these lampposts on the top right appear to have been missed completely. So they would con be considered missed detections. And there are some false alarms showing up as well, meaning that the radar says there's something here where it's labeled false alarms, when in fact there was nothing there at all. Now, a few seconds later, as I said, we repeated that on the right here. And this time it appears that the lampposts in the top right have been detected, albeit with some spatial errors. And if you look carefully, the, um, I think the tree is now detected here, which was missed earlier. We again get false alarms, but now in different locations. Now, what I'm trying to show here is that the types of sensor uncertainty that we get are both detection uncertainty, as well as state, or in this case, and usually in the case um, of SLAM, spatial uncertainty. In other words, when those lampposts are detected, it appears that the range and the bearing measurements are slightly off. So we call that spatial uncertainty. Uh, but initially, they weren't detected at all. And it's very important to realize that those types of uncertainty are completely different. Spatial uncertainty, of course, can be measured in meters. Detection uncertainty has no units at all. So there are different types of uncertainty. And it would be nice if we could uh, come up with a paradigm, and I'm going to try to convince you that random finite sets is the paradigm, that can really deal with both in a truly joint uh, manner. Here again is just to show some more results. This was um, a Navtech radar we used back in Singapore. And here you can see the colors represent the intensity information we get back from that um, radar. So uh, in the cyan and the yellow and the red areas, there are highly likely to be objects. The black points represent superimposed laser data. And here you can see one of the lampposts is actually missed by the laser, probably due to foliage being in front, or I'm not sure why, but you can see that we get missed detections, which is could be quite dangerous because the robot might think there's empty space there when in fact there isn't. And on this slide, of course, you can see the problem of false alarms. This slide is the result, or the scan on the right, is the result of superimposing all of the radar detections as a vehicle traversed this oval shaped path in the car park. It's a bit difficult to see in the photo, but this road continues under the trees on the left uh, over here. So on the right here, we're superimposing every single detection made by the radar as it traversed this oval path three times. Now, if you look at the data, it obviously contains a lot of useful information. Um, you can maybe just pick out the four coconut trees here, and there are four below. If you look very carefully, one, two, three, four. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse in real time but they do appear on the right, along with um, the wall here, there's even a chain in front of an entrance, which is quite nice. So obviously useful information in there, but to be expected as this robot kind of pitches and moves a little bit around um, on different axes as it's moving, because it's not perfectly flat, um, we get these false alarms, maybe where the radar beam hits the road or just simply noise causing false alarms as well. Now. Um, the idea of random finite sets is that we would like to be able to come up with Bayesian or maximum likelihood based methods, um, so statistical based methods, to jointly be able to deal with these detection as well as spatial um, errors. Now what I'm going to do to try to convince you and again to motivate you to this area of random finite sets is go back to some real basics in mobile robotics. and. What I'd like to show here is, is to talk about something called robotic mapping error. Now, the reason I like to talk about this is that, in my opinion, estimation has very little meaning unless you can really quantify the estimation error. It has little meaning to design an estimation algorithm if you cannot somehow quantify the errors that that algorithm makes. And if you look at a really trivial example here, we'll see some interesting things. So on the left, you can see a, a trivial plan view. And this green arrow is supposed to represent the trajectory of a robot as it moves in this two-dimensional environment. 
And the two green circles correspond to the ground truth location of two lampposts, for example, or two point features that are in that two dimensional environment. And they are represented by the ground truth vector M on the left here by the coordinate zero, zero, which is the feature at the origin. And of course the coordinates one, one, which is the second feature up here, um, at coordinates one, one. Okay, now in the sense that the robot here is moving, it might seem feasible that the first feature it detects and therefore incorporates into its estimated map, which are called M hat, would be the one at coordinates one, one. So here we have our first feature incorporated into the map. And as the robot continues moving, the second feature at the origin comes into view or falls in the field of view of the sensors or sensor, and it also gets incorporated into the map. So we have a ground truth map, which is 0011, and an estimated map, which is 1100. Now, from a naive mathematical point of view, the Euclidean error between the two of these is not zero, it's actually equal to two, even though this robot has actually estimated a seemingly perfect map. After all, it's detected both features and it's located them in exactly the correct positions. The only thing it's done wrong, if you like, is to place them in the wrong order. Now, you can of course say to me, well, that's easy to deal with this problem. What we could now do is kind of associate the estimated features with the ground truth features. And one way to do that is to simply permute our estimated map M hat. So we permute all the elements of that and we keep comparing. So in this trivial case, permutation just means swapping feature one, one with feature zero, zero. If I then go find the Euclidean error, of course it would be zero. So in general, if I permute all the elements of my random vector estimate and compare it, there will be one permutation which gives zero error if I have a perfect estimate of the map. But interestingly, um, by definition, mathematically, if you permute all the elements of a vector and compare it with another vector, you are by mathematical definition comparing sets and not vectors. So that's interesting that by doing that, you're actually considering them mathematically in a strict mathematical sense to be sets and not vectors. Let's look at another very trivial example. Imagine the same example again, but for some reason on the right here, the robot fails to detect the feature at the origin. Now the ground truth map is of course still the same, but this time our estimated map contains one feature and its coordinates are one, one. If I strictly treat these as random vectors, then there is no mathematical way to actually compare them because they have a different dimension. Um, it turns out, if again, if you look in the literature, there are um, methods to compare these two, things like the Hausdorff distance, the optimal mass transfer, optimal subpattern assignment, um, cardinalized optimal linear uh, assignment metrics, and so on. But all of these metrics work with sets and not with vectors. So we see that from a, a, a mapping estimation point of view, sets is already a useful um, concept. To kind of demonstrate that, uh, a little bit further um, and to kind of see the way we do map management and data association. Imagine I have a ground truth map here containing three features and my map estimate contains four features which are located as shown in this diagram. Now, one of the ways or a typical way to find the error in this case in the robotics um, field would be to do some kind of data association. The data association might say, well, let's connect the closest estimates and ground truth elements together, which we've done here in red. And map management would be like a heuristic, which says we're gonna kick this one out, the one on the top left, because it doesn't appear to correspond to anything. Then of course, I could now specify the map error based on the average length of these red lines or the average Euclidean error or distance between the associated features. But interestingly, imagine now that my map estimator didn't produce these four black crosses that you see here, but actually produced this result. Now this map, um, if I go back to the previous one, the previous one we considered is a subset of the one I'm considering now. If I apply that strict um, heuristic and mathematical method I just did, 
it gives me exactly the same map error, even though my second mapping algorithm is clearly much worse than my first one, because it's come up with all these false alarms. It's come up with all these false map points. So we can see that using um, traditional methods sometimes to quantify error actually leads to some very intuitive or unintuitive, I should say, um, results. Again, some more ideas behind why sets can be useful. Imagine we have a robot following a red trajectory through this bunch of obstacles or through these bunch of map features. Well, if the robot followed the red trajectory, it might seem reasonable that firstly feature M was um, estimated followed by M2, sorry, M1 followed by M2, M3, M4 and so on. So my vector representing the map could be the red one at the top here. Um, alternatively, if the blue trajectory was followed, then maybe M4 would be the first map element and followed by M3 and so on. If the black trajectory was followed, it could be that M6 was detected first. Now, this seems a little bit strange in that the only thing that's different here is the trajectory of the robot, even though the map is actually identical. So it seems strange that we're getting a different map even though the map itself hasn't changed. And the reason for that is that vectors change when I change the order of the elements. Um, interestingly, if you represent the map as a set of those features, the order of the elements within a set has no meaning at all and doesn't matter. In other words, if I change the order of any of these elements, the set is the same. And the set corresponds actually to all possible permutations of the vector. And in a, that makes kind of logical sense because features cannot and should not really be significant in terms of their order. Let's look at some more um, ideas, okay? Imagine we also know, of course, that if a robot is moving around in an environment, then the order in which it receives its measurements or its observations usually does not match the order of the elements if I'm using a vector to represent the map. For example, um, measurement Z1, according to this diagram, probably came from feature M7. So I need to use a data association algorithm, which is usually a heuristic based algorithm, to link or connect measurements with state elements before I can proceed to either run a Bayesian method or to do a maximum likelihood graph based solution to SLAM. So this is often referred to as the front end. Um, we need to solve the front end, that's these red lines, before the back end solver, if you like, can go and do this. Um, when we use random finite sets instead of random vectors for the measurements and the map features, um, we're going to show that the data association problem is circumvented. In other words, that's a very powerful property of using sets, is that you can actually avoid this data association problem, which is one of the most fragile um, problems of the standard SLAM framework. Um, how can we actually combine or how do we do map management is another interesting idea. Imagine the robot is moving around through its two dimensional world here. And imagine that initially there are three um, features in my map, M1, M2 and M3. And suddenly a fourth feature, which I'm gonna call M4 becomes um, detected and is approved by my mapping algorithm and I want to incorporate it, or incorporate it. Well, in the strict mathematical sense, you cannot add a vector with three elements to a vector with four elements. That's what we'd want to do. In our computers, we get away with it because these are represented with arrays. So we can just increase the dimension of our array and put it in. But mathematically, there's no clean operation to really write that. Interestingly, if we consider the map to be a random set, there is a clean operation. We can just consider the union between map elements M1 to M3 and the new one M4. Similarly, how do I actually deal with the fact that I may get a different number of measurements than the number of features in my map? So for example, supposing my map contains these four features M1 to M4, but my current measurement when I do a scan gives me five detections. How do I write a function which relates my five measurements to my four features? This is also not clear in state-of-the-art methods. Usually, again, we get around it by using heuristics. We kick out one of the measurements that we don't like for some reason, 
so that we have the same number of measurements as map features, and then we can write something down. But again, with random sets, there is a clean mathematical way to really express this problem. In other words, um, the sets of observations or measurements, um, Z, just one point, um, when I'm using sets, I use this math cow formation and using um, vectors, it's usually just the normal um, capital font that you see here. But the random set of measurements at time K can be considered to be the union of measurements which I expected to get represented by this set D here, they are based on um, the position of the robot, in union with possible clutter measurements. In other words, measurements um, which do not correspond to anything, such as you saw from the radar. They can be false alarms, for example. So hopefully um, I've given you just a little bit of a flavor as to why random finite sets could at least be interesting. What I wanna do next before I really start to talk about SLAM is to say, or to give some idea as to how can we do estimation with sets. So if we're convinced then that we should really represent our measurements as a set and not a vector, and we should represent our map as a set and not a vector, can we simply go and apply all the statistical methods, you know, a maximum a posterior eye estimation, Kalman filtering, all the Bayesian tricks? Um, can we um, cardinalize um, uh, a set and so on? Can we, um, uh, sorry, cardinalize, marginalize is the word I was looking for. Can we do marginalization on a probability distribution with sets and so on? Well, it turns out, we can, but we have to be very careful. So the next few slides I'm gonna show you are just to show you how we need to be careful with sets and what we can do with them uh, with a very, very simple example. Let's consider classical maximum a posteriori uh, estimation. So MAP estimation. If you remember what we're trying to do here is to do the arc max of a probability distribution on some random variable. So the question is, can we find the maximum a posteriori estimate when there are both detection as well as state errors? And in SLAM, state errors usually mean spatial errors. So can we do that? So let's look at an example. Okay, so simple example. Let's consider a mapping algorithm which says there is a map which contains at most one feature. Now, what do I mean by at most one feature? Well, the next bullet point tells us this mapping algorithm is 50% confident that there is a feature because we're now considering detection as well as spatial uncertainty. So the mapping algorithm or filter believes there is a, a target with 50% probability. And in the third bullet point, if this feature is present, to take into account spatial uncertainty, it has, in this case, a nice easy example. It has a um, a uniform density in the interval zero to two. So we're considering a, a really trivial one dimensional example. So we're doing mapping on the X axis. There's a 50% probability that the target exists. And we believe that if it does exist, it exists somewhere between zero and two. And importantly, we're gonna consider the units of this example to be meters. Now, interestingly, already at this stage, um, note that a random vector cannot jointly model this kind of feature state. If we use a random vector, it's not clear how you could include the detection or the existence uncertainty of 50%, as well as the spatial uncertainty together. Interestingly, if we use random sets to do this, we can. We can represent this all this information with what we call a Bernoulli random finite set distribution. Now, a Bernoulli distribution is the one written down here where we say the total distribution on this map set mathcal m is that it equals there is a 0 0.5 probability that the map is empty because we know it's only 50% likely to exist therefore it's equally likely 50% that it doesn't exist uh, pardon me and if it does exist then the distribution uh, along the space where it exists is 0.25 because it can exist between zero and two meters. So in other words, this is the density, the spatial density in the second one. And this is all the possibilities, so it's zero otherwise. So this distribution um, represents all of this information that we have here. Now, it's very easy to apply 
maximum a posteriori estimation to um, the values of a distribution. What we do is we simply look for the maximum, which is why it's called maximum a posteriori. And the MAP estimate in this case would say that the most likely scenario from this mapping algorithm is that there is no feature. In other words, that the map is empty because the probability of the map being empty is 0.5, whereas the other numbers are lower, okay? Now, interestingly, let's change the units of this problem from meters to kilometers, okay? So instead, what now happens is the spatial probability density has to change a little bit. It becomes a uniform density instead of between zero and two when it was in meters, because the problem is now in kilometers, it has to be between zero and 0 0.002 kilometers, okay? And if I write out my distribution now, we get 0.5 as before for the um, probability that the map is empty. And now the spatial density becomes 250 because it's only going between zero and 0 0.002 because of the change of units. So if I now apply maximum a posteriori estimation, it actually tells me a different result. In other words, the most likely scenario now is that there is a feature and it's somewhere between zero and 0 0.002 kilometers. Um, and that's the MAP estimate. So interestingly, um, by only by changing the units for this problem, maximum a posteriori estimation gives me a different result. Well, most, many of you may have observed the reason for that is, is that we're actually comparing a dimensionless quantity. And when we talk about detection uncertainty, the units of detection uncertainty are not meters or kilometers. And we're comparing that with a quantity which has dimensions. So the density for the distance here would be meters to the minus one for the 0.25 or for the 250 kilometers to the minus one. And we have to take care when we apply um, standard estimation procedures to sets because they're not always well-defined because of the presence of non-unity target existence probabilities. Now, this concept, this very simple example, if you like, has given birth to the whole area of what is called finite set statistics or FIS. And finite set statistics were kind of invented by Ronald Mahler back in the 1990s. And they correspond to mathematical methods that can allow us to integrate with respect to sets, which is not defined before, um, to, to define densities, and even to do things like this, MAP estimation and so on. Now, the filters that we use for random finite sets are finite set statistics based filters and algorithms. And I'm gonna introduce a few of them here. So um, let me move to the main part of my talk, which is on SLAM, and let's look at um, very brief review of SLAM. And again, let's look at some of the issues or some of the ways we can uh, implement SLAM with sets. And I'll try to convince you that there are some real advantages of doing that compared to state-of-the-art methods. As I think most people or probably everybody here knows is that SLAM is a dynamic estimation problem where we usually consider the state of the vehicle to evolve in time in terms of where it was in terms of any inputs that are applied, and there is uncertainty. Um, in a dynamic SLAM problem, or even a multi-target tracking problem, we can also consider that the map features or the targets also evolve or move in time. Often in static problems, we would just say that MKI equals MK minus one I to make things simpler. But in general, we can of course consider them to move. And we have a way of relating measurements to features and in general, of course, we, as we saw earlier, the jth measurement may correspond to the ith feature. They're not necessarily um, coming in in the same order. So we need to deal with that. Now, hopefully we can agree um, that a measurement, a set of measurements or a set of detections should actually be treated as a set. And the reason for that is, as I showed you earlier with those scans from the radar, that even when nothing changed in the environment and the radar did not move, the number of detections we get is itself a random variable. So a random finite set of measurements is actually defined here. And this one is specific for range and bearing measurements. So a random finite set of measurements would be a set of vectors 
The vectors themselves are random variables, meaning that the range and the bearing are prone to uncertainty, spatial uncertainty, but also the number of detections I get itself is a random variable. So a random set of measurements at one instant in time could be the empty set if I don't, if I fail to detect anything. On the other hand, it could be a singleton and so on. So random sets have an extra dimensionality to vectors in that the dimensionality of the set is also considered to be a random variable and will be estimated um, in various FIST-based algorithms. Now, state-of-the-art SLAM solutions consider the map uh, if we're talking about feature-based SLAM, and this talk is limited at the moment at any rate to feature-based methods, then the map is considered to be a vector corresponding to um, the locations, for example, of particular landmarks. And of course, what we want to estimate is a distribution on the trajectory of the vehicle for the full SLAM problem and the positions of these features um, in space, given all the measurements we've recorded from our sensor, given all the inputs, and importantly, we require, of course, these data associations to be provided by usually what's called the, front, the, the SLAM front end in order to be able to do estimation in the first. Well, I'm not gonna go through the maths, but state-of-the-art methods, maybe about 20 years ago, were Bayesian-based. Examples would be the extended Kalman filter, fast SLAM, which used particle approximations and so on. Uh, more recently, um, Graph-based optimi optimization approaches have been used using sparse optimization and um, uh, nonlinear least squares methods such as ISAM and the G2O solver, which is online. You can go and plug in your data. Um, the important thing is both of these concepts um, in their fundamentals depend on something called the measurement likelihood. That is how likely is a measurement given um, the, st the SLAM state, which is the trajectory of the vehicle and the position of the map features. And this measurement likelihood itself is dependent on correct data associations, which is what makes these methods very fragile in the event of poor measurements or um, difficult data association decisions. If instead I change my map, so instead of having a, uh, if I go back here, if I, instead of having a random vector-based map, as we saw here, I now change the map to be a random finite set, which I'm going to represent here, in which the number of map elements is itself also um, a random variable, then the measurement likelihood or the equivalent measurement likelihood would be written in this form. It's the likelihood of getting a set of measurements given the set-based map. Now, interestingly, if I consider data association here, we run into a problem. And that's a, a conundrum which Ronald Mahler stated in his book back in 2007, in that this above likelihood implies a data association dependent state, which implies some kind of order on the elements inside my observation set. And by definition, sets do not have any order. Now, therefore, to overcome this conundrum or this problem, the key behind random set methods and the fundamental advantage, and in some way disadvantage in terms of computational time, is to marginalize out the associations. One way of overcoming this problem is to average this measurement likelihood over all possible association pairs. In other words, I do a sum of P and consider every possible combination of the measurements and the map elements, and then I take the average of that, which is clearly potentially quite a large sum, so we'll talk about that later. The interesting thing is we can now, if we use these sets, we can introduce what we call a probability of detecting an object. We can also introduce the probability of measurements being false alarms. And we can actually come up with a multi Bernoulli set-based uh, measurement likelihood distribution, which looks like this horrible expression here. Now, although it looks quite horrible, if you follow the text, it is actually quite logical. The first term inside this sum, which is the spatial measurement, is none other than the one we're used to using. In other words, it's the given a particular association pair, I'm going to find my usual measurement likelihood. Um, we then multiply that by the product of all the probabilities of detection of all elements that are associated with measurements. We need to also take into account any elements which are not associated because they will probably have been missed. 
In other words, we need to consider all elements um, in our map estimate, which have not been associated with the measurement, and we multiply those by the probability of misdetection, which is the same as one minus the probability of detection. And then we need to consider the probability of measurements being false alarms. And by averaging or summing over all possible data association combinations, we have the true set-based measurement likelihood. Or I should have written it's proportional to that because there might be a normalization constant needed. Now, the important things to note from this kind of long equation is that this RFS formulation becomes equivalent to the standard vector-based one when the map size is fixed, data association is assumed, but the probability of detection equals one if landmarks are associated, and the probability of non-associated measurements being cluster equals one. So here we can actually conclude there is a generalization um, of the set-based methods. Here, what we can see is if we now use um, random sets, then we can come up with Bayesian methods um, to do SLAM. Um, we could come up with batch-based methods to do SLAM, but the important thing is by using random sets for the map and the measurements, we now have a measurement likelihood which is effectively circumventing the data association problem. So Bayesian-based solutions include things like the PhD filter, um, GLMB, which is generalized labeled multi-Bernoulli filter and so on. Um, and so forth. Okay, so I've talked for a long time. I'm going to show you some results now. I know I might be a bit over time. If you didn't really follow or you're not interested in any of that, I think this slide is a nice summary that shows the difference between random set based estimation, whether it's for SLAM or multi target tracking, and random vector estimation. If I have a random vector boldface X that you see here on the left, and I use Bayes' theorem to estimate it given some measurements, Bayes' theorem can be written in this form. Now, if I change the order of the elements in X, which is equivalent to changing my data association decisions, in other words, which measurements in Z correspond to which elements in X, Bayes' theorem gives me a different solution. And that's very important. The philosophy behind finite set statistics and random set methods, in other words, is that when I use Bayes' theorem or maximum likelihood methods or even other statistical methods, is that if I model the set instead as a random set instead of a vector, then the order of the elements in X doesn't matter. In other words, if I change the order of my elements in X due to data association differing decisions, which have no real meaning anymore, then Bayes' theorem and maximum likelihood methods always give me the same result, independent of the order of the elements of the set. Okay, let's just show some results and um, quickly show you, hopefully, some of the advantages. So why use random finite sets? I think we've tried to justify it. We, there is set-based algebra is now widely available, particularly due to finite set statistics. Data association is considered jointly within random finite set estimation frameworks. And we can even come up with mathematically consistent definitions for metrics, we can quantify the error in a map, even if there's a different number in my of map features in my estimated map than there are in the ground truth map. Solutions that have been presented recently are PhD filter solutions, probability hypothesis density, um, labeled multi Bernoulli filter was introduced in 2015 by Stefan Reuter at AL. They applied it to SLAM, and I'd like to show you some of our most recent results, which use a hybrid generalized labeled multi Bernoulli filter, which allows us to use um, graph-based approaches to solve the SLAM problem. So allow us to use um, nonlinear um, least squares optimization. So things like the G2O solver within the actual framework. Let me quickly show you some old results from PhD filtering so that you get a, a gist of the advantages. And then I'll show you the newest results and then I'm finished. So imagine, this is a simulation again. A robot starts at the origin, so in the middle here. The green trajectory corresponds to the true path the robot takes in its environment, and the green circles correspond to, I think, 27 true features, which point features or lampposts, if you like, that we're looking on top of in this plan view. The red path corresponds to the estimate according to fast slam, which is a state-of-the-art random vector method using a particle filter and extended Kalman filter. 
And underneath that, although you can't see it, there is actually a black trajectory corresponding to this one called the Gaussian mixture, oh, let me go back, PhD SLAM filter. And again, the black crosses and the red dots show the map estimates. Now, here you can see that both algorithms perform pretty much equally well, but it becomes interesting when we start to throw clutter at this problem. Now, this is the same data set that we used in the last experiment, but now we're actually adding uh, three false alarms for every 10 by 10 meter squared area. So every little 10 by 10 meter area here, every scan, I get three false alarms. So that's the clutter density of 0.03 per meter squared. And I've superimposed them all here as the robot moves around the trajectory and keeps on scanning. So it looks um, pretty bad. When I now apply the same algorithm, instead of getting these results, we now get these results where, again, ground truth is in green. And we see that the vector-based fast slam solution diverges in its trajectory. And it's pretty easy to see why, because it's overestimating the number of features. If you look at the feature at the top left here, there are five fast slam estimates of it, when in fact, there's only one feature there. And that is, of course, caused by all this clutter measurements here. Whereas within the random set framework, the PhD filter, because it's jointly estimating the number of map features, it's correctly estimating one feature, even though there's still some spatial error. Now, an error uh, plot that is often not shown in SLAM is this one, where we see the estimated number of features versus time. Well, because this is a simulation, I know that there should be um, zero to 27 features estimated in my map as I go around here, as they come into the field of view of the sensor. Uh, you can see that with the green theoretical line here, which is always increasing um, as each feature element comes into the field of view. The vector-based solution is clearly overestimating it because of all the clutter, whereas the random set solution has a pretty good estimate of feature number, which is an integral part of really solving the SLAM problem. Um, here you can see that radar data again I showed you earlier. If I, in this example, to show you the, I showed you the false alarms we get earlier, all of this data was superimposed onto the ground truth trajectory the vehicle took. If I superimpose that same data, all those detections onto the odometry path of the vehicle, I get this mess here. So this could be considered to be the true input to SLAM. And here we can see the solution um, using random vector-based methods on the left, and then uh, the PhD solution on the right. And you see a clear uh, improvement, again, because it's estimating feature number as well as state or location. Um, I couldn't resist putting this in because you're all in Sydney. Um, I'm gonna show it, it's very, we did this some time ago. What we're seeing here is of course, Victoria Park in Sydney, data that you or some of your members um, themselves collected. And we've taken that data and there's been many papers published with it where they show EKF SLAM in some sense working, fast SLAM working. Now our PhD SLAM worked as well. Now what we wanted to do is we wanted to try to break the algorithm. So we artificially injected false alarms on top of your data. So I'm sorry, but we corrupted your data to try to get these algorithms to fail. So we were adding a certain number of clutter measurements per square meter every time we get a scan. And what you'll start to see is with the fast slam alternative, it's doing pretty well up to here. I think as soon as we get up to this part, we'll see some interesting differences where um, I think there's a part where it obviously a data association decision or a pretty bad one is taken. And we start to really get the divergence of the fast slam algorithm where it, the trajectory is clearly being estimated through buildings which was not possible. Whereas the PhD SLAM solution, even with all this clutter and false alarms, is still able to um, estimate paths, which are pretty close to those published in other papers. The red path here is the GPS, which is a bit broken up because of GPS um, outages. Okay, finally, I'd just like to show um, some of our new results, which we're in the process of publishing. We've um, produced, again, a random set-based filter called a hybrid generalized labeled multi filter. Um, and it's trying to solve the SLAM problem. The key behind this filter is it considers a Bernoulli distribution, um, which is hybrid in form. It's hybrid because the SLAM state is, we believe, hybrid. It contains a vector, 
representing the trajectory of the vehicle and a set which we believe is more appropriate to model the map. Um, so we end up with a distribution whereby R is an existence probability for a single feature. So we consider a single feature M and we have a distribution on the trajectory of the vehicle, which is multiplied by one minus R if the map is empty, because it means the probability of non-existence of features. And we have a different distribution modeling the joint. Um, this is a joint vector distribution for a single feature and the trajectory multiplied by the feature existence R. Um, the idea is that we can now make use of standard generalized labeled multi-Bernoulli filters where each Bernoulli component um, represents maps of possibly different size and with different data association decisions. And we form weights for the GLMB filter and we can actually optimize the spatial distribution using the state-of-the-art G2O solver. So the way this works is Again, we have our vehicle moving around, we have inputs, we have measurements, and the features are shown as these gray um, hexagons. And we're trying to solve a distribution on the vector trajectory and the map set for the vehicle. And sorry, I think I jumped a few there. The way we do this is by considering uh, histories of possible data association hypotheses. In other words, these red lines here are important. They correspond to data association hypotheses at particular times. And in order to get the correct measurement likelihood for sets, we need to marginalize out those associations to make it um, circumvent this association problem. So very quickly here, we can see um, a, a trivial example where at time k minus two, we have a single um, generalized labeled multi-Bernoulli component corresponding to a single data association set. So this considers associations that took place at time k minus two and k minus one, and we're labeling them with a zero because it's a single set of association decisions. Now we can make a prediction based on those associations as to how we think the vehicle moves. And we could even predict a third set of associations, even though we haven't got the measurements yet, we could naively predict that none of the measurements will be associated with anything, for example, in which case it would be an empty set. Then what we do is we consider um, using what we call a Gibbs sampler to test several association hypotheses. And a Gibbs sampler allows us to do that in a computationally efficient manner. So here we're considering, for example, um, this one, the top graph here is repeated from the one below. Okay, so these measurements have now arrived. And then we're gonna consider an association history by adding an association um, variable or set to that. So CK1 now corresponds to an association with the new measurement. So ZK3 has been associated with um, a new feature M4 here, which wasn't in the upper graph here. We can also, of course, consider adding another one, M3 onto that as well. So again, we now consider adding CK2 onto this. We can now consider even changing the history of these associations. So for example, whereas previously back in position XK minus two, the first position M1 was associated, we see the red line at the top here, in the bottom one, we decide that it isn't. Now, of course, you can imagine testing all of these combinations is gonna be an absolute nightmare, a computational nightmare, um, which is why we rely on an approximate Gibbs sampling method to make this computationally tractable. And what you can see here, is the results of running this. So on the left here, we have this hybrid GLMB SLAM approach, which is not being given any data association information at all. In gray, you can see the odometry trajectory. And in blue, you see the um, estimated trajectory and the blue crosses the estimated map, superimposed on the red ones, which are the ground truth um, values. This data, by the way, comes from the G2O library. We can generate this um, all kinds of different data sets from the G2O library. And on the right here, you see um, the standard G2O solution using maximum likelihood data association, which is a little bit inferior. But note that we did this experiment with low motion noise. If we now increase the motion uncertainty um, in a, a different run, again, here on the left, you can see a video for the um, hybrid GLMB filter. You see it's already starting to make some 
data association errors, distorting the trajectory in the map. But you'll notice in a minute, it will, is able to correct that based on the fact that it is actually testing and changing historical data association decisions right along the path. So in contrast, it's just done it. So you saw that that um, trajectory moved. If I go back again, here it's got the error here and now it's corrected it. So as time goes on, it's using this Gibbs sampling method, which is an area of future research that could actually be changed, but is actually able to um, correct itself using the G2O solver um, several times um, in order to come up with a more consistent estimate of the map. And you see that because of this high motion noise, the G2O um, solver based on maximum likelihood data association pretty much fails to come up with a, a consistent solution. Here at the end, it's coming up with some slight errors for the hybrid <coughs> GLMD solution as well. So I apologize, I've probably spoken a bit over time. This shows the errors of the two, but I think you could pretty much show them. This is the final slide before my conclusions where, um, of course, the if we use either a nearest neighbor or maximum likelihood data association method front end, uh, we can solve this pretty quickly, although the errors, as you see, are huge. The OSPA distance is the mapping error, and it terminates after only 200, uh, about 280 iterations, whereas the um, vectorized or the hybrid generalized labeled multi Bernoulli solution uh, needs much more. However, it scales in the same way, but is just simply a multiple um, of the time longer because we need to run G2O several times more than in the first case to test all these data association uh, hypotheses. Okay, I'm sorry I talked a little bit long, but finally, future work and um, conclusions. I think in conclusion, state-of-the-art random vector methods, both in target tracking and in SLAM, um, we initiate features and targets in a heuristic manner. We deal with detection uncertainty via heuristic map management methods, which are often called the front end, if you like. Um, we then try to apply external to the Bayes um, or the maximum likelihood estimated routine um, feature track association methods uh, for which computational approximations are sometimes necessary. And only then can we really apply Bayesian or maximum likelihood methods such as the least square solvers to basically a subset of the measurements that we get in order to um, try and get a solution. In contrast, if we use RFS methods, well, it's still true to say the initiation, initialization of features and targets is somewhat heuristic. We usually need what we call a birth um, concept for features. However, we can apply the principled concepts such as Bayes or maximum likelihood estimation to all the measurements and um, all the currently estimated targets without the need for these fragile map management and data association methods. And I guess in conclusion, there are still many things we can do, particularly other filters or um, estimators that could be designed based on random sets. And even dealing with extended targets is very interesting where we get interesting, where we get several measurements per um, item or per semantic feature maybe in the environment. So I apologize, I know I spoke a little bit too long, but I'd like to thank the many team members that have helped. These pictures were taken in Singapore on the right when we did C trials. I didn't have time to show you those. And this is um, part of the team in uh, Chile. And I'd like to thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, for this excellent talk. Um, I really enjoyed it. And even though we're past the hour, I think we can yeah. still take a couple of questions. So if you've got any questions, just unmute yourself or raise your hand. Um, I've got a question here. Um, so you, you said that the main incentive for doing this work is to solve the data association issue. So if you have, perfect data association, for example, by RFID tags, or you know, you have barcode scanners or something like that, um, would there still be an advantage in using set-based methods? Um, little advantage. I think if, you, if data association is solved and even the map management problem is solved, and if you know the number of targets or features that are there in a feature-based SLAM scenario, I think it's pretty difficult to to beat the standard least squares solvers. So no, I don't think it would. The idea behind the random sets is not only, I mean, the data association issue, but it, it estimates 
the number of features, or if you're doing multi-target tracking, it also estimates the number of targets. And if you think about it, if there are um, 100 targets out there and 1,000 false alarms, being capable of monitor or estimating that number is, um, is very important. It's key to solving the problem, because if you realize that maybe um, 900 of your measurements are actually false alarms, then you're, you're quite a long way on to solving the target tracking problem. So yeah, I mean, if you say data association is given, um, random finite sets can still help because at the end of the day, they are a generalization. So they reduce to the random vector problem. If you put data associations in, this, there is still the advantage of the set-based methods that it will still estimate for you the number of um, features in the environment. But if that is known as well, then it's a, I'd say that's pretty much a solved problem. But I would argue also, of course, that data association is often still a problem, particularly in bad weather conditions. Maybe some of those RFID tags in a mine become obscured with dust. Uh, you cannot sense them. So they're, they're, you do end up with detection and um, measurement errors. And therefore, I, I think concepts like this will always be very important in realistic scenarios. Thank you. Do we have any more questions from the audience? I see that a few people have dropped off already. Um, yeah, I would, um, Costa, I'd just uh, like to thank Martin for an incredible talk. Um, I didn't understand it all, but it looks like um, you're solving really serious uh, problems that, um, that we've sort of puzzled about for years, particularly the clutter issues with uh, the radars that we have. And um, I'll certainly be looking into some of your work in a bit more detail and see if I can understand it. So I need to go to another um, uh, place now. But thanks again. So cheers. Oh. Thank you. Oh, thank you for listening. Great. Yeah, I'll be happy to talk to you. I think that was Graham talking, right? I assume it was Graham. Yeah, that was Graham. Yeah, nice to see. Yeah, nice uh, to see. Yes, it was me. Sorry, I should have un undone my video. Yeah. No, no, don't worry. Thanks. Thank cheers, you. Martin. Cheers. <clears throat> Um, I was, if I can ask another question, I was wondering, um, you know, in, in, set, in set theory, you know, setting up these mathematical properties looks really nice in formulas, but often very simple looking set operations are quite computationally expensive. So can you maybe talk a little bit mm -hmm. about, you know, the computational expenses co which comes with all these things like, you, you know, you mentioned you're doing the Gibbs sampling to actually solve the complexity, which sort of sounds almost like, okay, you're through the back door, you're, you're putting in a heuristic again, which is kind of what the data association did in the first place. Um, so. I think it, come, it comes down, yeah, I mean, there, there's always, um, uh, I guess my last slide is, there's always approximations to for a, an engineering implementation. I think it comes down to the very basic concept of um, do you make approximations right at the beginning and then try to use principled methods or do you base everything on principled methods and then make the approximations um, later on? Uh, we would argue that the second one, the latter is the correct way. You should formulate your problem in a principled manner which we think random finite sets allows you to do. It allows you to really formulate Bayesian or maximum likelihood based methods, which are known, accepted probabilistic optimization methods, um, using all the measurements uh, and um, all the state values, and even considering detection as well as spatial uncertainty, really in a principled manner. Of course, then when you build um, an implementation of it, there has to be approximations. On the other hand, what we would argue is that when you use a random vector method, right at the beginning, you already have to cut out um, maybe 90% of your measurements if you get a thousand measurements and you've only got a hundred state elements. And then you start thinking about Bayes' theorem and maximum likelihood methods, which to me is quite the wrong way to actually go about it. Now, the reason I'm showing this slide is that this is the killer um, computational expense, if you like, in random set methods. However, it is the correct um, measurement likelihood which should be used. So as I mentioned, in random vector-based methods, we only use the first term inside that summation 
And of course, if you use only that first term, it's extremely dangerous because you have to assume that theta is right. In other words, the data association um, hypothesis is correct. Otherwise, we all know that even the most modern G2O slam solvers fall apart. Now, a lot of people in vision have done amazing things with these descriptors so that they can try and get this right. So I agree in some sense, if you can really guarantee data association, then I'd say SLAM is largely solved. But there really are still many scenarios, bad weather and so on. And even, even in good weather, where data association still um, causes a lot of problems. So this formula, in general, of course, would be very expensive computationally to solve because it requires you to calculate all of these things for every possible measurement to state association pair. And that can be um, huge. But luckily, there are principled mathematical methods out there, such as um, Gibbs sampling. There's also loopy belief. Um, there are all these kind of machine learning type methods, um, some of which have proved convergence properties. So um, Gibbs sampling is actually proved to converge. Um, it's a random sampling method, and it's a way to really reduce this computational complexity. There's also matrix permanent methods. There's all these mathematical tricks out there to enable you to approximate it. And again, I would argue that the approximation here really comes after you've got a principled method and considered all your measurements. Whereas I would argue that the other way around, in my opinion at least, is, is not really the right way to do it. I think I agree with you. Um, with that, let's thank Professor Martin Adams again. Um, yeah, thank you a lot for this talk. Um, yeah. Um, see everyone next week. Okay, thank you very much for your time. It was an honor to be here. Thank you. Yes, thank you for coming and presenting. No problem.